Uh, my name is Jim Fonseca. Um, I want to apologize. I caught a, I've been traveling for about two weeks and I caught a cough, probably from one of my little cousins in the past uh, a few days, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, so I'm a research scientist at Purdue, uh, the Network for Computational Nanotechnology. Uh, Gerhard Klimek uh, is the PI in our group. Um, I'm going to talk today about a few things. Um, I will talk a little bit about our research. Uh, I did want to focus, since I talked about that in previous years, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I work on, um, testing in NanoHub, um, but we'll get to some of the science later on. Um, oh, and to point out, so NEMO uh, is nanoelectronics modeling. Uh, if I mention iNEMO, that's kind of our group. And then NEMO 5 is the software we work on, which if you can guess is kind of the fifth incarnation over the past 20 years. Um, so we're interested in looking at semiconductor device physics. Um, you've, you've heard the talks uh, in the past couple of days about um, you know, what's going to happen as devices are scaled smaller and smaller. Um, <clears throat> I keep hearing whether Moore's Law is like dead or alive. It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat at this point, I think. Um, and I did a <clears throat> super scientific study of Googling Moore's Law dead versus Moore's Law live, and in fact, dead came up uh, with two and a half times as many hits. I don't know what that's worth, though. Moore's Law imperative. I've been very interested if there are other uh, industries that have set the same goal, but that's a different discussion. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we're interested in looking at um, very small devices. You can see the uh, eight nanometers here, so we're, we're really down into the region where you can count the number of atoms. And so we live in this, <clears throat> this area. I have people like Josh on the DFT side. Um, and on the other side, you have TCAD. And this is actually still what's used a lot in industry. Um, most of the TCAD software is basically uh, uses continuum methods with quantum effects mixed in. So we're sort of in this region where we want to be able to do kind of devices with tens of thousands of atoms. Um, the approach we use for this is tight binding. So we'll basically take DFT results and parameterize those. Um, here are some of the, the features that NEMO 5 can do. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but basically it's multi-scale, multi-physics. And we're looking to kind of get device characteristics as outputs. Um, I think it started about, NEMO 5 development started about 2010. Uh, we were not very well prepared for the switch to many core programming, so we've kind of been backtracking, um, looking at OpenMP. Um, we've been doing developing, doing developing on the um, uh, four GPUs and Xeon 5s, but it definitely would have been a lot easier if we had kind of done that in the first place. Um, so I want to switch real quick. Um, so as I mentioned, Gerhard Klimek is our PI. He's the, the head of NCN. Um, the other half of his research is uh, nanohub.org. Uh, so this is NSF funded. Um, I like to call it a cyber infrastructure for science. Um, you can also think of it as a really cool website. <laughs> they have... Uh, tons of um, uh, different resources uh, of all types of nano anything. Um, and those resources are, a lot of them are just kind of static things like uh, lectures, presentations, things like that. Uh, one of the cool things though is that there are a lot of tools. And basically when I say tool, it means you can run simulations right in your web browser. Um, these are using, uh, they run on uh, Purdue, uh, compute clusters, and there's basically an interface that allows you to, uh, anybody can put a tool on NanoHub uh, if you've got underlying code, whether that's, you know, code that you've written that's just command line arguments, um, or, you know, an, a already available code, you can basically put a really nice GUI onto it. Um, people can come. Um, to NanoHub and use that and run it on produce resources. I actually want to switch these two slides. So we've got about, eh, about 10 tools that are based on NEMO 5. 
Um, some of them are kind of research, or I, I guess more of them are probably education oriented. So, you know, Brilliant Zoom uh, Viewer, uh, Crystal Viewer, Band Structure Lab. These are something that would be geared towards, you know, say sophomore undergraduate students. Um, this is an example of the GUI we have. So you can simplify, say, device design or inputs for the user. Um, it has a lot of nice output features that you can do. I'm going back a slide. Um, and we have pretty widespread adoption. So these are the, the about the 10 tools that I showed. I have 22,000 users, 430,000 simulations. And they do a lot of statistics on NanoHub. So they've been able to see that there are, using data analytics, they can see that there are basically classes where they'll have say 30 people from a particular location come and use a tool you know, for maybe a couple days for homework assignment. And then they can even see that perhaps a week later, the same 30 people come back and they use another tool. Um, I wanted to, this doesn't get talked about too much, but testing. We have about 30 people in our group, um, most of whom are uh, develop, helping to develop Nemo 5. Uh, it's about 500,000 lines of C++ code. Um, things break. Um, so one of the things when I, I realized when I came there is that we needed to be able to do testing because a lot of times a student would run a simulation and a couple of weeks later they'd run it again and would have a different result. And now you've got to figure out what happened. Um, and I didn't really find, when we started this about three years ago, there weren't really any solutions that I found for this that were really you could take off the shelf. Um, I worked with uh, two very uh, talented students, uh, David and Santiago. And um, we decided, I mean, th this is kind of what we wanted to do. We basically wanted to make sure we were getting correct results um, as people were changing the code. You know, we also wanted to see did things slow down, is using more memory. Uh, we want to be able to make sure things look worked well in different uh, compilers. And then you've got to get it fixed, too. So you've got to find out who broke it uh, and hopefully alert them and give them everything, as much information as possible to say what, what broke. I'll skip this. This was kind of a, a previous incarnation that we had for testing. Um, so the solution they came up with uh, was to use this open source package called Jenkins. And I had not found this in all the time I spent searching because apparently testing in some circles is called continuous integration. <laughs> so that was news to me. Um, uh, this is just an overview of the infrastructure. I kind of just use this, use this slide to point out that um, there, there are a lot of parts that can break. Like pick a line here or a box and there are a dozen different ways something can go wrong. Um, but basically you have a, there's a Jenkins web server. Uh, of course, it has a database to keep track of what tests we have. Um, it's interfacing with the SVN repository where the code is. And then it's basically sending jobs out to the clusters. Um, kind of the, the uh, similar information shown in a different way. One of the biggest parts that was missing from this was that Jenkins had no interface to deal with PBS. Like Jenkins like, doesn't know what PBS is at all. So um, we developed something called a launcher, um, w which was significant. It's like 5,000 lines of Python just to deal with taking a, taking a test, um, submitting it to the compute clusters, um, querying whether, you know, whether the job is done, getting the data back, um, putting stuff in the appropriate databases. Uh, for, so for a particular test, you basically have an input file, you have resources, this is essentially just how many cores you're going to need and how much time. Um, and then we have output, uh, a reference output data. The simplistic way we do, or we, we check like whether a test is working, is you, know, you simply run the test once. Um, a lot of our data is, is nice because it's very simple, like for a device, uh, we may have an IV curve, right? So this is nice and simple, it's nothing complicated. Um, so we use a, um, 
developed a what we call smart diff, which is like Linux diff, but just a little bit smarter so it can deal, it can give the, the test some fluctuation. So you would say if, if results change by 0.001%, like we don't care. And that we can adjust that too. If in, in some cases, for instance, for an off current, um, which is very small, you may want, you may care if it does change. <clears throat> um, I'm happy to say that this is actually, the students actually use this. So we have 500 tests. Uh, most of these are regression tests. Um, there are some um, students who have developed unit tests. Um, but it's nice because we can look at uh, different compilers. Usually when things break, um, it's across the spectrum. It's going to break on GCC and Intel compilers all at once. Um, but, but sometimes it's good to have uh, that backup. Um, I'm always trying to get the students that they always want to submit these like huge tests. You know, it's like when you're debugging, right? It's like, no, I don't want, I don't want to debug something on, you know, 64 cores. It's going to take four hours to get to the problem. Um, I was talking to Jeremy about this yesterday. Uh, we don't have any blue water specific tests. Um, in hindsight, I probably would have spent time doing this in the past. Um, it's basically because of the token. All of this, the whole testing system is automated. So it's the tests are uh, started either on timers or because somebody's made a change to the code. Um, with blue waters, because you have to use the token to log in, um, I think the, the idea we had yesterday was, you know, somebody would receive a text message and you got to type in your, your token code and that would allow uh, the Jenkins server to log in and start the test. That was, yeah, I'd like to. We have some uh, remote other tools that submit jobs. Hmm, okay. Um, it'd, be, it'd be especially helpful for the builds, mm -hmm. um, even just compilation. Uh, so Jenkins gives you this really nice um, interface. Um, we have different, these are the different uh, builds, like compilers and machines up here, uh, tests. Um, you can um, see the build queue. This is all the stuff that it's going to run. Um, if there's one drawback to Jenkins, it's almost, it's, it's too flexible. It can be... I, I've gotten um, more acquainted with it over the past couple of years than I can say I, I thought I would or that I would have wanted to. Um, but we can do some cool stuff so we can track warnings. Um, you know, if you use the, you know, the to do, you can track things like that. Um, we can also measure things like peak memory and time, um, and users can set thresholds. Um, a lot of times, I'm always surprised at how often you can see these, this is a really short simulation. Um, there are, um, and even on you know, local workstations, I'm not pointing fingers at Purdue resources at all. I mean, e even like local workstations, it's amazing like how often simulations will change from, you know, one run to the next. Um, if you've got multiple things running on it. And, with our, even with the workstations, there may be multiple simulations. So, you know, if something's right in a disk, it's going to slow something else down. Um, so one of the, one of the balances we've had to find is how to, um, you know, tell people there's something wrong without spamming them with emails uh, every time there's a little hiccup. Um, and then for any test, it's nice. You can go, you can get a tarball of what happened with the output, um, log files, Um, so we've got a few minutes left to talk about some of the uh, uh, the scientific research that's been done. That's that we've done. Um, I haven't been directly involved. I don't do more of, I guess, the HPC side and the testing that kind of stuff. Um, so I will try to give a brief overview of some of this work. Uh, so uh, Bojadar is a postdoc in our group, and he's been looking into what happens when devices turn on. Um, you know, usually for transistors, people are interested in IV curve. 
um, but what actually happens in those those few picoseconds, um, you know, when you when you apply a voltage, um, and so he's uh, developing a, a time-dependent Schrodinger implementation, uh, which he's found is valid up to a few gigahertz. He's been working on GP GPU implementation for Blue Waters. Um, this is. Um, I, important from an energy usage standpoint as far as how fast you're turning the devices on. Um, I think uh, Tarek's been doing a lot of this work with the compact quantum dot compact modeling. Um, this is the closest thing. You know, I saw the, the tornado videos yesterday. Did anybody see those? Those things are amazing. Uh, so I don't know. The best we have here is kind of this, I don't know. It's, it's much more soothing green color on my laptop up here. It's kind of I don't know if it looks as nice. Um, uh, the research they're doing is they're basically looking into strain and quantum dots. And what they've been able to do is use um, these multi-million atom simulations on blue waters to develop a quantum dot. And what they found is that in some situations, um, they can, they've created a compact model where you really just have to look at the dimensions of the quantum dot in order to get a pretty good idea of its properties. Um, so this is a case, I mean, I think I've heard a couple of times over the um, past day and a half about, you know, computing smarter, not harder. So this is a case where, you know, Blue Waters has made it such that um, in the future we, we can use this compact model and get results in a fraction of the time. Um, uh, Gen Z's working on this project. This is uh, uh, sponsored by LumiLeds, which used to be Philips LumiLeds. Um, and this is pretty cool. So these are nitride light emitting diodes. <clears throat> these are used for medium to high power blue light. Um, in this case, it's an example of a multi-physics approach where the, um, the barriers, oh, sorry, the, ignore the red and the green, sorry about that. Uh, barriers are in equilibrium and the wells are in non-equilibrium. Um, and they've been able to um, um, match up with some experimental data quite nicely. For instance, um, experimental data was showing that the, the well on this side of the device uh, was producing much more light than the, the wells on this side of the device. And that's basically due to this deeper um, density of, of uh, carriers in this well. So they've been able to simulate that. Um, and they also get uh, a nice correspondence with experimental values, although they do have to add in a factor for the series resistance to account for that. Uh, finally, um, so tunnel fits, um, if you've heard of those, they're um, one possibility to replace standard MOSFETs. Uh, James Charles has been leading most of this work. And so the cool idea with a tunnel FET is that this is like your standard transistor, where basically your electrons on this side are gonna get pushed over to the other side, and there's a gate voltage that's gonna push down this barrier in the middle. Um, so what the tunnel FET does is it says, uh, we're gonna allow the electrons to move directly from the conduction band tunnel through this barrier to the valence band. Um, one of the most promising uh, aspects of this is that you can get a much better, <coughs> excuse me, uh, sub-threshold slope. Um, this would be really important for reducing power consumption of devices. The main problem with these devices is that they can't get the on currents large enough right now. Um, and so James's work is looking into um, how these devices work with, excuse me. James's work is um, looking at how these devices interact with, or, or uh, operate when you have electron-electron uh, -electron phonon scattering. Um, and I find, I don't, I don't fully understand this, but I found it was really interesting that when you add scattering, you actually get a higher current uh, than if it's just ballistic. Which, which is supported uh, by experimental data. So I'm not just saying that like, oh, we have this result, we can't 
resolve, I just found it interesting. Oh, sorry, I'm right on time. If I can get to the next slide, there we go. Um, so I'd like to thank, I guess, all the students who have done this work. Um, the Blue Waters team, uh, Ryan is our point of contact for our PRAC. Uh, Sharif has been helping a lot um, with some of the complexities of dealing with a large group um, with an NSF and our other uh, funding agencies as well. Thank you.